In 1909, when August Belmont lifted the ceremonial first shovelful of dirt in Bourne, Massachusetts, there's no way he could have imagined the striper fishing culture he'd be creating around that seven mile long land cut between buzzards and Cape Cod bays. On this trip, I'm fishing the Cape Cod Canal. It's right on the cusp of the fall run, and I'm hoping to find some early running stripers taking the express lane back south. For going on 80 years, surf casters visiting the canal have kicked off their outings at Red Top Sporting Goods. In the 40s and 50s, you'd find Red Top regulars sorting through a box of eel skins they'd affixed to specially made lead heads. Today, canal anglers are much more likely to pick up a soft plastic paddle tail, a modern staple for fishing the big ditch. That's exactly what I'm looking for, along with some intel on the recent comings and goings of the local bass from Red Top owner, AJ Coots. So is there any big bait, any mackerel or not, not there's recently? There's still some mackerel around. Uh, there's squid at the bulkhead too. Okay. So there is some squid and because the squid's around, there are some bluefish around. Okay. The bluefish have been wreaking havoc on the soft plastics. It's good for you. Oh, it's good for business. <laughs> it's good for business. Um, yeah, I mean, we love bluefish, but a lot of guys, when they're down there jigging, they're so used to jigging the, the savages, the gags, all, yeah. all, all those soft plastics with a lead head. Um, they don't think of it. Uh, the bluefish comes, bites right behind the hook, bites their tail off, and then they'll switch over to a metal. Yeah. So they're still gonna jig, or a bucktail. You know, they're still gonna jig. Something that's gonna stand up to the blues. But it'll hold up to the teeth, that's right, so. All right, so we're going out this afternoon, and then tomorrow morning at first light. What part of the canal would you recommend? Yeah, I would definitely hang out towards the east end. Middle to east, but probably more towards the east. Okay. Um, anywhere from pips probably to the, to the fish pier is a pretty safe bet right now. All right, good. There's a lot of bait down there. There's been a lot of fish pushing that bait up onto shore. So that's where I would start. I mean, obviously things can change pretty quick on the water. You can just go, oh, wow, there's a school of fish blitzing. Boom, throw Especially a pencil on. This time of year, man, one tide change, you don't know when the whole school is going to come in from down north and start wreaking havoc. No so. doubt. And it, and it can change east to west. One tide, boom. And then it, it's either dead or it's lights on, you know? It's yeah. crazy. So. AJ, man, well, thank you for the Absolutely. intel, dude. I'm going to uh, pick around real quick, go to, uh, get some necessities, and then head out. Dude. Perfect. If you got any questions, give me a holler. All right. Thank you, dude. Yeah, so as we were saying in Red Top, it's the end of the summer, beginning of the fall. We just had the full moon. Full moon was last night. And uh, this is pretty much the start of the fall run for us here. It's kind of starts out as kind of a walk and then things will really pick up. We've got northeast wind, a storm coming through. Feels like things are about to break wide open. I know today they had a decent amount of fish this morning. Uh, they had a decent amount of fish in the east end. So if you're going to look at the map of the canal, it's divided into three parts by the two bridges, by the Bourne and the Sagamore Bridge. Everything west of the Bourne Bridge is called the west end. Everything between them is the middle. Everything east of the Sagamore is the east end. Right now, the east end's been hot and a lot of that is just because of the time of year. We've got all these fish coming down from Cape Cod Bay, from Boston, from the South Shore, from Maine. They're gonna funnel in the first place they hit when they take that shortcut through the canals, the East End. So we're starting to see some fish trickle in, starting to see some peanut bunker moving through. And um, you know, we're gonna try it this afternoon and then get back out there first light tomorrow. But right now I'm just adding some of my new additions to the, the tackle box based on what AJ said. I wanna pick up a couple more things just to make sure I have everything I need. One nice thing about the canal, is that you have your bike with you, so you don't have to be too selective. I don't care if my bag weighs 20, 30 pounds, because it's not gonna be on my shoulder the whole time. I'm gonna be carrying it in the bike and then placing the rocks behind me. Way different than if you're wading into the surf and you have to have that bag on you at all times. My recommended lures from Red Top to add to the tackle box. A little restocking on the paddle tails. This happens to be a Fish Lab paddle tail. They all have a similar setup where they have the, the jig head that meshes perfectly into the body slim profile and then that paddle boot tail is going to kick as you retrieve it. Just driven a lot of miles up and down this canal. It's our last season. It's okay. A couple more good rides. My canal cruiser is a very bare bones one. Like all I have is a milk crate, legally obtained, not stolen from a Cumberland Farms so if that's what you're thinking. Just don't look too close at it. A um, couple PVC rod tubes attached with hose clamps. Now, guys have these tricked out unbelievably where they will have 
pool noodles around their uh, crate where they stick the lures into. They have cup holders for their Duncan. There's so much stuff you can do with a canal cruiser. This one, she's giving me all she's got to see the condition of this bike. It sees a lot of salt, gets wet. It's out in the elements all the time. I just buy them used. Um, I bought this one from, I think, Canal Cruisers up in Buzzards Bay a few years ago. But I do think I'm going to upgrade to uh, one of those e-bikes. There's a lot of benefits to those for fishing. But for now, we're going to do it the old-fashioned way with the old trusty Rusty right here. The Canal Fisherman's preferred mode of transportation is a rod holder and milk crate fitted bike known locally as a Canal Cruiser. These bikes allow fishermen to load up their gear and cover the nearly seven miles of service road without taking their eyes off the water. When the fishing is good, that bike comes in handy for playing leapfrog with the schools of stripers moving through with the tide. When it's slower, it helps cover ground quickly to find where the bass might be hunkered down. Looks good. Let's feel for bottom. So under most circumstances, this reel right here, a Shimano Stella 14,000, would be ridiculous overkill for striped bass. But if you regularly fish the canal, you're fishing big weights, you've got big current, and it just wears and tears on the gears of these reels. So when you, you that's why you see a lot of guys using these tuna grade spinning reels in order to, otherwise you're constantly servicing them. And the other nice thing about this, the uh, Stella 14,000, is that it takes up 54 inches of line with each crank. So after I'm jigging, done jigging, I can rip that, that in really quick. If you're fishing a pencil popper, see fish breaking, you can get it in there real fast. So the faster retrieve speed is a real kind of benefit here. At night in the surf, I love my van stalls. I love going a little bit slower. Those only have like, I think the 200 is 36. It takes in 36 inches per crank, perfect for working needle fish and things like that. But in the canal, I want this higher speed retrieve. I want a gear that's gonna be able to, to stand up to that repeated, like just lifting and dropping of five, six ounces. And this is, this isn't even my heaviest canal outfit. This is a rod, 11 footer, rated three to seven. This is kind of my middle of the road canal setup where I can throw these jigs, bounce these paddle tail jigs and do pretty well with them. I can throw pencil poppers on this. I can throw minnow plugs on this, magic swimmers. And then if I'm really serious about the jigging, which is something that is a really specialized technique, not my forte, I do it a little bit. That's an even heavier rod rated up to 12 ounces and that you're throwing six, sometimes seven ounce jigs, depending on the current and just constantly bouncing and feeling for the bottom. With these jigs, these paddle tails, that the difference between that and the other jigging is the paddle tail it's gonna create a lot of drag that's gonna make that lift up in the water column. So once you hit the end of your retreat, once you hit the end of your drift and you start reeling it in, that's gonna plane up toward the surface. So if you wanted to stay on the bottom, you would ditch the paddle tail, go for a straight tail jig, and that'll be easier to, to keep down deep. But in this situation, looking for fish, looking for peanut bunker, this paddle tail's got a little bit more added attraction. If I was fishing structure as opposed to looking for schools of fish, I was going to bounce it into a hole. I would want a paddle tail or a straight tail or a bucktail jig. But I've got this Fish Lab Mad Eel to throw here and see. We can pick some fish on the end of the west this afternoon and then we'll be back here for the east tomorrow. Now, for line on this setup, I've got 40 pound tests. Even though everything, you know, there's big fish, tons of rocks, heavy current. I like the smaller diameter 40 pound test over 50 or, or 65 or 80 um, for that extra casting distance. I know guys who on their pencil popper rods will throw as light as 20 or 30, mainly to, uh, 30 pound test because that can be a situation when you're top water fishing, that distance can be essential. Getting So taking every advantage you can get. This is 40 pound test, Seaguar Tactics. That's their four strand braided line um, and that has a little bit better abrasion resistance than those smoother eight strand braids. So even though I might be able to cast a little bit further with an eight strand braid like the Smackdown, the four strand braid's gonna give me extra abrasion resistance. And if you just look at the ground here, all these rocks are covered in mussels. That's gonna be, uh, you want every bit of abrasion resistance you can get. Um, I have my leader attached with an FG knot. I've got about eight feet of 50 pound test Seaguar inshore 
and then that ends in a tactical angler's uh, power clip. The afternoon fails to produce a fish, which honestly isn't that surprising. While there is sometimes good sunset fishing at the canal, almost always sunrise brings the best action. I pack up the bike and head home, setting the alarm early for the next morning. While the flip of a calendar page from August to September is mostly symbolic, on the pre-dawn commute to the canal on September 1st, the temperature gauge in my truck dips below 50 degrees for the first time in months. It's a good sign, see the bait zipping around? All right. It felt like an early taste of autumn, and I was hopeful that the fish would react to it. The current's picking up speed, the bait's here. Just need the bass to wake up. You usually want to do this around what's called breaking tides, which is what we have right now. And that's when you have the tide switching from west to east, and that coincides with first light. In general, that's when you have your best shot at seeing surface action, as opposed to when you have the higher tide. And a lot of that, the guys think it's because like the fish come in at night from Cape Cod Bay, or they push the bait in, or the bait comes in, follows the west tide in, and then the fish feed on their way out. But it varies. Different parts of the canal fish better at different tides. felt like you had to start with a pencil popper. You know, unless you see the fish on top, they're doing most of their feeding closer to the bottom. So even though I'd rather catch them on top water, I'm gonna switch to a jig and I'd rather catch them. <laughs> they just freaked out right there. Right, man. All the signs are here. I'm not feeling bottom though. Good, good. It's good. Might be small fish, maybe missing it. Usually a bigger one doesn't, when he wants it, he doesn't miss it. That's all right. There we go. It's not a big one, man, but all right, there's a few of them, man. So the second cast with the jig, three hits, there he is coming up top. All right, buddy, just a little guy. Just a perfect little bass. All right, good things. I missed him, he came right back. It's another little guy. It's still, man. It's just the very start of the fall run. These fish just keep getting bigger and more numerous. Bigger. 
little bigger than the last one. A little lure change. This is one of those paddle tails like this. This is a bait designed for snook in Florida that kind of made its way up to the northeast. There's been a few of those that have really been catching on with the, uh, with the striper guys last couple seasons. This is called a big bait fishing. Never go wrong with yellow. It's a pretty light crowd for a uh, breaking tide at the canal. Savage sand eel. Let's go with this one. A little bit smaller profile, heavier head. Oh, that was one. Okay. Good. A couple teeth marks in that one. That might be uh that might be the bluefish we've been hearing about. What's amazing about canal blues is they seem to refuse to come up to eat topwaters most of the time. They sit there and wait for a soft plastic to come through. That was 100% a bluefish. And what's amazing about them too is they have an incredible knack for getting the jig right below the hook. Now we'll see, this is the same exact spot where I just had that bluefish bite it. There's a similar bite. This doesn't feel like a blue though. Well, oh, maybe. Got a little more pull to it. Maybe it is a bigger blue. Still don't know whether this is a bass or a blue. Hit right where I just got bit off. Definitely got a little more pull than those last couple schoolies. Big blue. I was talking about how, with AJ yesterday, about how these guys are very good for business. That, that's a pretty healthy bluefish. And somehow he managed to somehow he managed to spare the soft plastic. Let's get this hook out. Oh, there's fish on top. Yeah, all right. A little blitz coming through. I gotta get a pencil on quick. A little school of fish just came through on the surface. East tide's getting cranking. Sun's coming up. Baits around. Blues and bass feeding on the bottom. And it was last night was like the first. Oh, he's on it. There he is. First cold night. Oh, it's the start of the fall run, man. I literally just cut back that leader. I and mean, this isn't a monster fish, but he's a little bit better. He's uh, big enough that if I still had that damaged leader and was fishing it, I'd be puckered a little bit right now, but there's some bigger bait there. Oh, shit, did you see that? What? Feet. Was that what that was? Yeah, was there was one right on the. I saw. I, I thought there was a bait fish. Dude, that was it. That was like really the same size blue you just caught. Oh, really? Across your toes. No, I've been seeing some bigger stuff waking in close. This guy hit at the very end of the cast. That's a really big blue. Oh. 
こうね。That last one was a good one. This one's even bigger, man. Oh. Vicious, vicious fish. Whoop. That's a good one right there, man. I love stripers and I hate to admit it, but pound for pound, bluefish are definitely stronger. A little careful extraction here. Shouldn't need the pliers. Although if he bites me, the video will probably go viral. There it goes, comes right out. Big blue. I think I just got finished saying how they only seem to eat soft plastics in here, and then here's a big one comes up, eats a pencil. Gorgeous. <laughs> I was gonna nip your ankle on the way out. Yeah, I felt his belly across my toe. <laughs> <laughs> Dude's fighting one there, man, it's coming alive. It's absolutely coming alive right now. There's more fish on top. Oh, little tar target practice. A little behind him and a little short. We'll see, maybe it's close enough. Come on, He's, is he behind it? No. cast with a pencil and they're like got that one but the bottom is probably just coated with fish well, just based on the last two fish I'm gonna guess it's another blue it's jumping out there not jumping but swirling oh fish on top fish on the bottom and man this is a It's not crowded right now. And it's just because the reports haven't been great. This is, a, this is a bass, I think. All right, man, just a mix of bass and blues, dude. Just classic fall run fishing. The biggest striper in the morning. I switched to this the Z-Man plastic thinking uh, it would stand up to the blues a little bit better and then I, uh, you know, best bass of the morning eats it. The bites come quickly as the tide hits its sweet spot. Fast enough to get the fish feeding, but not so fast that it's tough to hold bottom. The fish aren't big, but this is just a taste of what's to come over the following weeks. Pretty steady paddle tail bite since we got here this morning. Oh boy, yeah, we got big waves coming in. Didn't expect this much surf. What do we got? Little bass. We got it. It survived. Still there. Seems to be a lot of fish this size today. This has blue fish written all over it, I think. They're almost parallel with the bank, just retrieving it in. This one had a little more fight for his size. Kind of a funky stripe pattern on him. Is it on both sides? Look at that. Stripes get scrambled a little bit, right? We might be just about done here, man. Like it might be. Tide's really ripping now. Oh, it's about time for breakfast. The current's picking up. Fishing seems to be getting a little more sporadic, but man, that was a great, it's only 7.15 now, a little bit after uh, 
I can still make it to work on time. I might milk it a little bit more though.